In this lesson, we are looking at transfer and transformation of matter this time. Here's our subject matter. It is from topic two, unit three. All right, energy flows through the ecosystem via photosynthesis. We know that. Cellular respiration and the transfer of biomass through consumption, right? We're talking food chains here. The sun provides a constant external supply of that energy to keep the system going, right? Even when it's lost from, you know, waste or, or respiration or heat. However, the amount of matter or atoms in the earth, in the, you know, the universe is fixed. So there's no further entering our system. So it must be recycled within that ecosystem. Otherwise, it's just not usable. All right. The elements of most important to living organisms are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen, right? Also phosphorus and sulfur, but we're not talking about them today. So we need a continuous supply of these elements um, and in order for the survival of all organisms to continue. So we're talking things like glucose and amino acids. We absolutely could not live without those two things and many others. And we know that they need the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygens, and the amino acids need the nitrogen. So elements uh, can be recycled through both the biotic and the abiotic parts of an ecosystem through organic and inorganic molecules. So again, those inorganic molecules like water or carbon dioxide. All right, so we are talking about biogeochemical cycles today. And the bio obviously is the biological component of this. The geo is the geological component of the earth. The chemical cycles is the fact that we're talking about elements and molecules. And the cycle part is that we're talking about movement and exchange between different components of our environments here. Now, nutrients will cycle through all of the elements of an ecosystem, not always in an even timing or distribution. Both the abiotic and the biotic components are going to be cycled through. Starting with the water cycle, also known as the hydrological cycle, all right? And the water cycle is something you've seen probably in your primary school. Water is not really nutrient. It has no specific nutritional value, but it's both a habitat for some organisms and it's incorporated into every single cell in our bodies. So I guess we could say it's fairly important. Now around 95% of the water on earth is found in oceans, but it needs to be incorporated into the biosphere. So it can be found on earth as a solid, a liquid or a gas. Now water enters the biosphere, right? The organic component via photosynthesis where it's incorporated into carbohydrate molecules. So the hydrogen and the oxygen are incorporated into the carbohydrate molecules and the water is being taken in by the plant as either water vapor or via groundwater through the roots. It's released back into the atmosphere through transpiration, um, cellular respiration and decomposition, right? Also parts of the geological section, we're talking evaporation and you know precipitation, just those basic procedures that we learn about. All right, the carbon cycle is really, really important because carbon is the basis of every organic molecule that makes up our cells. So our carbs, our lipids, our proteins, our nucleic acid. It also, however, has a really large range of compounds that exist outside of the biosphere, which allows carbon to cycle in and out. So we uh, often talk about dissolved carbon in the oceans. Now, just I'll encourage you to take a minute to sort of pause and have a look at this diagram. It is very busy. The carbon cycle has components which fluctuate and some that are really steady. Now, if we're talking carbon sinks versus carbon pumps, we're talking things that hold on to carbon for a long period of time, like fossil fuels in the Earth's crust um, versus a pump that's, say, pumping it out back into that cycle. Um, so carbon cycles through the biosphere via photosynthesis again, okay, we understand that, and respiration as well. So it's coming in, being incorporated um, into whatever, being removed via uh, CO2 through cellular respiration. And the non-biotic components, we're talking combustion, so burning of things like fossil fuels, dissolving into the ocean, and also weathering. So the weathering of, say, rocks um, adding to carbonates in water sources. So the carbon cycle, you know, it's a really fine balance. And so the balance of atmospheric carbon dioxide is mainly occurring between photosynthesis, so removing the carbon from the atmosphere, and cellular respiration and combustion, putting it back into the atmosphere. Now, this balance is obviously very disturbed when we do things like burning of fossil fuels. The problem becomes, you know, we could go, oh, it's fine. We could dissolve it back into the ocean. It'll be okay. But the problem is that as more CO2 enters the atmosphere, our temperatures rise. Now, as temperatures rise, it decreases the ability of the ocean to actually dissolve that CO2. So any CO2 that's already dissolved in the ocean can actually be released back into the atmosphere. So it's this horrible positive feedback loop. 
right? The nitrogen cycle is quite complex, but it's an interesting cycle that requires our old friend's bacteria to come and help out, okay? So atmosphere, the atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen gas or N2 gas, but organisms aren't able to access this form at all. It's inaccessible, but we need it, right? Every single protein, every single amino acid needs that nitrogen. But unless it is uh, changed into a form we can use, it's not accessible at all. So we have nitrogen fixing bacteria that can do this job for us. And they turn ammonia into nitrites and then eventually into nitrates, which is a version of nitrogen that plants can use and therefore we can consume. Now, again, take a moment, have a look at this cycle. Nitrogen fixing bacteria will turn, so nitrogen fixing bacteria are here. They will turn uh, the N2 gas in the atmosphere into ammonia, right? And that ammonia can then be, uh, you, other bacteria can then turn that into nitrites and nitrates, and those nitrates can be used by plants. That's what we need to have. We need it in the form of nitrates. Now, ammonia is uh, also added to by, say, dead organisms and, and just excretion of waste. Funnily enough, though, lightning also contributes to nitrogen fixation and can turn the N2 gas into a form of nitrates. Right now, the nitrogen cycle would be absolutely nowhere without bacteria. Without them, the uh, nitrogen would accumulate in the soil. It would not be able to be turned into an accessible form. Um, so there's a really nice adaptation made by some plants where they use these nitrifying bacteria and house them in nodules on their roots. So this way, the bacteria receive a bit of protection and the sugars are from the plants uh, photosynthesis essentially, and the plants readily receive access to source of nitri uh, nitrates. My apologies. So nitrifying bacteria in root nodules are 10 times more productive at fixing atmospheric nitrogen than free soil nitrifying bacteria. So it's actually a very good adaptation. The nitrogen cycle is really complex. It's going to take a few goes for you to understand it. So please don't expect that you'll get it just by staring at the picture. So our subject matter is all about the cycling of nutrients. We're talking specifically water, carbon, and nitrogen.